Um, okay, so what I'd like to do now, and this is going to be a fairly important section, which is really trying to figure out how do these herbicides um, work. And you've seen them in lab, okay? So hopefully this is going to be reinforcing what, what you know. Also referred to as biochemical side of action, okay? Just some, some general characteristics. And this information is in your notes. Uh, your notes are more detailed in many ways, okay? So uh, if you can listen in, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to, to follow a little more clearly. But what we're looking at is the mode of action. Again, we talked about this. Refers to the way the herbicide, okay, affects the plant. Basically kills it at the tissue or cellular or biochemical level, okay? And there, we, we talked about at least nine modes of action in lab. And I'll go over those and specifically talk to you about how this, those herbicides affect the plants. Okay? One thing you've got to keep in mind is that a herbicide with the same mode of action typically has the same means of translocation. Okay? So something that is, uh, you know, pretty close to what glyphosate is or sulfosate, which is touchdown, is, you know, transported in the phloem. Okay, in the symplasm. So they're very, very, you know, generally very similar and generally produce the same symptoms. Okay? This is, there is variability. It's pretty hard to generalize, but, you know, I, I would say that this is generally true. Okay? The one thing you've got to keep in mind is that selectivity, soil behavior, and use patterns are not identical. Okay? For herbicides, even though they have the same mode of action. Okay? You're going to get some products, for example, Clomazone or command does n is not translocated very much within the plant. In that same group, okay, the bleachers, as we call them, the bleaching type herbicides, you have something like amitrol, which in perennials, when applied post emergent, can travel quite well. So, although we generalize, you know, there's, there could be differences, and that's what I want you to, to be aware of. But these are kind of the, the, the common, okay, themes for, for, um, for some of these products. Okay? And I have this here. This was my little fooling around with the computer. Not, when faculty are not busy, they do these crazy things. And then I got these, these wheels spinning and stuff. All this is trying to get your attention is remember, all of this is basically some of these herbicides are going to basically shut down some key process in the, in the plant. Okay? And that's what this is, is that all, it's all intertwined. One of these wheels goes, and I was trying to kind of break it up and see if it would explode something, but I couldn't find it, okay? Is we're going to talk about the photosynthetic inhibitors, glycolysis, electron transport. You know, these are all, okay, important processes. And if any of these are shut down by our herbicides, the plant is basically, not only is it not going to do well, but it also, you know, will die. So we'll talk about some of these specifically, but... This is my, my cool art, okay? So in terms of terminology, we've already gone over this. I just want to double, double check this, make sure you all get this. I could see this in the prelim three, compare and contrast. What's the difference between mode of action versus, sorry, mechanism of action, okay? So mode of action, and again, I tried to dim it. I didn't realize that, you know, hopefully you can see it. General term, a much broader term that basically tries to tell you overall how does the herbicide kill the plant? Is it affecting photosynthesis? Is it affecting cell division or mitosis? Is it uh, disrupting the cell membranes? We're not specifically looking at the precise biochemical pathway, okay? So for example, Roundup, okay, inhibits an enzyme that's important in the production of amino acids. Nowhere do we say, oh, it affects this important, you know, ESPS enzyme in this pathway, in the shikimic acid pathway, that would be a mechanism of action. So the more precise, specific, that's the term that I like to use. These two terms are often interchanged, and so don't be surprised to say, geez, Tony said that was precise, and they're still saying mode of action, they're talking about this precise biochemical pathway. It, it, it might happen, but just in my own definition, I'd like to, to separate them out. You should also realize that some herbicides can kill the plant in various ways, but they have what we call a primary, okay, mode of action and a secondary mode of action, okay? So sometimes you have a herbicide that might affect photosynthesis and then also affect, say, uh, RNA, you know, um, development and so forth. 
the primary mode of action is the one that is the first to shut down an important plant process. Okay? So photosynthesis is the first thing that's, you know, basically broken down or the system breaks down. We call that the, the primary. Okay? And I'll give you some example of these, but just, just be aware. Side of, side of action, when people talk about side of action, is where in the plant, okay, is the herbicide, okay, exerting its toxicity? Is it in the plastids? Is it in the vacuole? Is it, na you name the cellular structure, okay? So it's be, you know, you need to be aware, where's this going on? I mean, is it just like on the leaves? Is this stuff getting in somewhere, okay? Because sometimes you forget that. You're so busy, you know, trying to learn the other material, you forget where is this happening? And here's what I was referring to. Primary mode of action of a herbicide is the vital process first known to be blocked or disrupted, which results in plant death. Okay? The oxen type herbicides, that includes 2,4-D, dicamba, okay? they do. The primary mode of action is that you have these, these, um, these herbicides acting as um, oxen mimics. They basically, the plant reproduces uncontrollably. The phloem is then choked off. Okay, and transport doesn't occur, so you have a number of ways that the plant is killed. Okay, but the one that's first, the first vital process, and usually this is, um, you know, researchers are able to, to point that out, that's going to be the one that we refer as the main way that the plant is killed. Okay, chlorosis, we talked about that in lab, you'll see it again today, you know, say, oh, look at the plant, it's chlorotic. Loss of green pigment, okay. We'll see that in, obviously, in the bleachers the, and, and atrazine. Necrosis, for those of you who are not familiar, this is basically the death of the plant tissue. So typically you go through chlorosis, and then that moves into necrosis, where basically the cells, the plant tissues die. Okay? They, they lose, they become brown. It's what we tell them while the plant's dead. Okay? Um, herbicides such as paraquat that are contact herbicides very fast, you don't have chlorosis. The cells, I mean, it's so fast acting that you go straight to necrosis, okay? But say ALS inhibitors, you know, if you're using Accent, Nicol Sulfuron, some of these products, they, they kill the plant. It takes two weeks to kill the plant. You go through these, okay? So when I talk about, oh, look, is the plant necrotic, that's what we're referring to. Two other terms that I think you should definitely be aware of, acute toxicity, okay? This is basically the rapid kill, okay? Of plants, after you apply a herbicide, you typically call, refer to those herbicides as contact herbicides. The examples here would be paraquat, would be probably the best example. But also some of our diphenyl ethers, fomosafen, okay, reflex, would be another good example. Okay? So contact, they're not translocated. The plant is killed quick. Okay? And, and I'll go through that. As opposed to chronic toxicity, okay, this is slow-acting okay you basically it's it's what we call systemic herbicides like roundup is a good example glyphosate 24 d is a good example okay where basically the plant growth stops as soon as you apply the product basically but death is relatively slow you go through the chlorosis process necrosis and it might take weeks two three weeks and remember we talked about how the growers are not crazy when they see this because man they don't want to be there three weeks seeing the, the plant, they're wondering, is this thing going to die or not? For all practical, practical purposes, it is. The plant has, is not really competing any longer, but you just visually don't see it. Okay? So be able to juggle these terms and be clear as to what they mean. Okay? So that's why I, I've included those there. Okay. The nine modes of action, I'm just going to put that list up again just to kind of, and what we'll do is we'll go through each of these, but I'm also going to show you a scheme that I think in the past has really helped the students out as a way to kind of make sense of all this, put it in categories that makes a lot of sense. And it's based on whether the herbicide is applied to the leaves or to the soil and, what, and where it's moved. Okay? So I'll be able to... So here they go. Um, and as I go through this, I'd like some of you guys to scream out an example of a herbicide, okay, that... Um, has or exhibits this mode of action, which is disruption of transport system, interference with nucleic acid metabolism. So you see there, the primary mode of action is, uh, you know, both transport of systems, but also interference with RNA. What's an example of this, or a family, or a group of herbicides? Dicamba, 2,4-D, the benzoic acids, the, the uh, phenoxies, the 2,4-D group is that. That's exactly it. 
Disruption of mitosis. Group pentamethylin, prowl, treflan, trifluralin in this group. Root inhibitors. Remember, we saw the clubbing of roots and so forth. Okay? Inhibition of carotenoid formation and of an, of, at least of what we call the protox oxidase enzyme. What are these? Callisto. These are the bleachers, what we call the bleachers. Okay? Callisto, mesotrione, fomosafin, acyfluorophen, blazer. Okay? They basically bleach command. Clomazone is in this group. Okay? Number four, inhibition of photosynthesis, inhibition of ATP, the currency for plants. Okay, what's in there? The triazines, okay? The ureas, these include linuron, okay? Metribuzin, atrazine, cymazine, all in that photosynthetic, okay? Uh, let's, inhibition of lipid formation. ACCase inhibitors. No. The DIMS and the FOPs, they're graminicides. They're the ones that where the, the grasses just become real mushy at the surface. They, they pull off post, cetoxidim, fluazifop, acclaim, fusillate, if some of you are familiar with those products. The, the, right, the DIMS, the FOPs, because they end in that. And they basically inhibit um, lipid formation. Of course, what are lipids important for? Membrane structure. So if you don't have, you know, they're the building blocks, just like amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. What are proteins important for in, in plants? What, what are some key structures? Sorry? Enzymatic. Enzymatic reactions. Membranes. I mean, this is, these are all key, key components. Okay? Inhibition of acetolactic synthase enzyme. ALS inhibitors. What's this? ALS inhibitors. Nickel sulfuron, halosulfuron, the sulfonyl ureas, you know, permit, uh, uh, pursuit, imazepapir. This affects this enzyme that's key to the production of branch chain amino acids that only plants produce. Okay? In fact, those three, only plants produce them. So that's, how we, that's why we've got to eat, you know, vegetables and vegetation because that's, it, they, we, don't, we can't produce them. Okay? Valine isoleucine, okay, are, are, are in, that, in that group, okay? What about inhibition of shikimic acid pathway? Glyphosate, Roundup, Touchdown, Sulfosate is in that group too, okay? Inhibition of glutamine synthase. Liberty, glufosinate, okay? And we'll talk a bit about that. Glutamine, we're very, very important in kind of an ammonia cycle. And lastly, the disruptors of cell membranes. Paraquats, diquat, okay? So, what I'm gonna do now is, those are the most, so it's, I mean, it's a lot, you know, trying to remember what's, so let's do it in a systematic way, and if you could study this way for both your practical and for your prelim three, I think it's gonna really help you. And I know the group last year really liked this way of, of, of going at it. It made, made it a little more sense of it, okay? Here's the scheme that I'm gonna use. And that's how I have them in your notes. The first, okay, group that we're gonna be looking at, the mode of action are gonna be foliar, generally foliar applied herbicides, okay? Generally speaking, they're foliar applied, okay? And then we'll break them up into three categories, sub subcategories. They're foliar applied, they're translocated, okay? And they show initial symptoms in new growth. So what do you think? What is this going to be? Some plastic type herbicide transported or apoplastics types? If it's affecting new growth, it won't be apoplastic. It's going to the growing tip, so it's got to be some plastically translocated. This is going to be the um, the Roundup group. Okay. The second group we're going to divide. They're going to be foliar, generally foliar applied, but they're going to show initial growth. Uh, initial symptoms on old growth, the older plants. So where do you think this is going to be? Xylem. Sorry? Xylem. It's going to be xylem transported if you apply them to the leaves. That's not to say that they can't be applied to the soil, but generally, yeah. And where is it going to go if it's moving in the xylem? I apply it on the leaf, and do you remember that, that slide I had up? What happens to it? It just moves to the edges, towards the edge of the leaves, and the older leaves are affected. It's not going to be moved up. It's just up to the leaf, the stem, to the transpiration, out 
transpiration stream, so you'll see the damage along the margins, okay? This is where you'll get the, uh, the atrazines, the, okay? The triazine group, so, okay? And lastly, these are going to be foliar applied herbicides that are not translocated, i.e. they're not moved. Wherever you apply them, that's it. And they, they show initial localized injury. What am I talking about here? Paraquat. They're just, they're just wherever you apply it, it's applied. Remember, paraquat has no activity in soil. So you don't apply it to soil. You've got to have, okay, same with Roundup. But the difference is that Roundup is in that first category, okay? It'll be here. It's, it's showing it's translocated, okay? So that's the first category. The second large category are those herbicides that typically are applied to the soil, okay? Generally speaking, okay? And they affect spindle fibers. Remember in mitosis, okay, in the metaphase that you, you get the separating out of the chromosomes, okay? The, you're going to have issues here with the spindle fibers not forming, i.e. you're going to have real difficulties in, 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 as the new cells develop, you're not going to have the right number of chromosomes, okay? These, these are also referred to as the cell division inhibitors, okay? Cell division resulting in shoot malformation. So example, here would be pendimethalin, prowl, treflan, trifluralin would be in this group. Soil applied, and remember, I mean, at least for treflan, is that a PPI pre or post? PPI. Okay, pendimethalin, you can apply it pre-PPI as well, but they affect, and, and you'll see the damage in the roots first. That's what I'm getting at. Cell division resulting in shoot malformation. Can you name a herbicide that's applied to the soil where you'll see damage first in the shoots? Sorry? Uh, Duo will, will hit both. It, it could go in there. There's no doubt about it. I was thinking EPTC. Eradicane or Eptam, remember, you'll see the, you know, you pull out the roots early on, the, the uh, shoots, the grasses are all twisted and curled, and yeah, the roots look fine, okay? Whereas for Prowl or Treflan, you pull out the roots and they're all clubbed and stubby and so forth, okay? So that, that's this group, and, and we'll talk about a couple other herbicides that, that fall into kind of other cell division abnormalities. Metallochlor would fall in there, basically takes care of things, okay? So this is the scheme. You're going to have this and you're going to write the various, we're going to take the various herbicides, examples, the various uh, modes of action and go through each. So we're going to start off with, okay, foliar applied herbicides that are translocated and show initial symptoms on new growth. So I'll take each of these categories, give you some general characteristics. This is in your notes, maybe not in this format, but it's in your notes and then give you examples. What are the examples of herbicides that fit in here? And what is maybe the, the, the mechanism of action? A little more precise physiologically, what's going on? Okay, this group of herbicides, okay, which includes 2,4-D glyphosate, okay, are symplastically translocated, i.e. they move through the cells. Go back to, you know, the translocation, okay, notes. These do not go around the cell walls. They have to go right through the cell, okay? They are flow mobile. They're moving through living tissues. That's why they can't kill the plants too fast. Okay? They are downward mobile. They can go, remember, if you're coming up with water, you, water, you're going to follow the transpiration stream. You're not going to go back down into the roots. These guys can. You apply them on the leaves. You apply Roundup on the leaves. It'll be brought both up towards sinks, the growing meristematic tissue, and down storage organs, bulbs, tubers, rhizomes. Okay? And base repeatedly translocated, base going towards the base, as opposed to acropedal. Just terminology. Often, these are pretty well s synonymous, but I just, there's various ways you can say it. Okay? So, for example, on prelim three, compare and contrast. Tell me what's similar about these two terms, what's different. If I would say something like base repeatedly translocated and downward mobile, you, you could say what's common about these two is that uh, they're both, you know, Talk, you know, this are, are ways that, that herbicides are translocated in plants, G generally speaking, those that are symplastically. Uh, what's, what's, uh, that's what's common. What's different about them? There isn't that much difference. They're actually very similar, okay? So, I mean, it wouldn't be a trick. Well, I wouldn't try to do it that way. I probably would say basopetal and acropetal, and you would have to say, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, one's transported in the phloem. The other is indicating transport in the uh, xylem. Okay, 
This group of herbicides, keep in mind, 2,4-D, Roundup, okay? Affect growing points, new leaves, storage organs. Effective against creeping perennials. If any of you are working in fields where you have yellow nut sedge, Canada thistle, okay? Field bindweed, these are the her type of herbicides you want to use, okay? You don't want to be using other herbicides because you need to get into those, those rhizomes and those creeping roots, okay? So I don't want to see if I, on the prelim three, I give, you, I give you a situation and I say, and I will do that, put you in a situation and say, what herbicide would you use? And I'll give you a choice of herbicides in this situation. These are all practical, realistic situations. I'd want you to be thinking and say, you know, and if I'm telling you you've got, you know, canna thistle patch in your corn uh, and you're coming to me telling me you're going to put paraquat down or some, that is not going to cut it, okay? You're not going to get, you have to be thinking, is this an annual, biennial, perennial, okay? And if you have forgotten, I would even indicate it. I would say Canada thistle, a creeping perennial, okay? Just to kind of remind you, just in case you, uh, I don't remember what it is, Okay. Symptoms are not noticeable within a few days, but plants die slowly from top to bottom, okay? So you're going to see the damage in Roundup in the growing tip, and then it moves its way down as the plant shuts down, okay? Very, very important. Kind of just these are the, the general as we now go into the specifics. Any questions? Okay? Start kind of thinking it in this way. Where will I use this type of herbicide? And that's what we're going to do this afternoon and, and tomorrow in lab is based on crops. Okay, within this foliar applied, translocated, and you see damage first, okay, in new growth, this is one of the big groups. We talked about it, okay? These are the, they disrupt transport systems. Are basically, the phloem gets clogged because the plant is dividing uncontrollably, okay? And the examples are the phenoxy acids, MCPA, 2,4-D, which is one of the herbicides. I've tried to to bold and put it in, in, in yellow, the ones that you're, you need to, to be thinking about, at least part of your 16, 2,4-DB, Buterac, okay, I didn't put 2,4-D, Amine, I did not put the um, a, a trade name, why? Why didn't I put a trade name for 2,4-D like I did here? There's, there's lots of them, there's lots of them, and I mean, it's very, so I wouldn't ask you. The other thing I, I want to ask you is, um, well, what did I want to ask you? Hey, why do I have 2,4-D, Amine? How come I don't just have 2,4-D? What do you guys know about 2,4-D and how you apply it? Oh, that's a great question on the exam. I know it. It can come in different forms, like an ester or... Salt or amine. Right. What is the active ingredient? What's 2,4-D? 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacidic acid. Acids, you can't formulate. You can't be spraying the stuff. It's just... Not going to do it. So you combine it, okay, with salts to get amines. And they're not, remember we talked about it, and if you combine it with an alcohol, you get these esters that are very volatile. You have to be really careful. These things could be, they're effective, but they could be very problematic. That's, okay, why we use the amine. You have to be a certified crop applicator to be able to use the ester form of it. And around landscapes, we don't use that, okay. Where we use the ester form often some people use it outside, but it's in, in revegetation, forest, forestry, where you're revegetating an area and you need to control some of the plants, then the ester forms are usually used because there aren't people around, generally speaking, non-targets are not as problematic, okay? Another group is dicamba, which is in the benzoic acid. One of the, the, one of the trade names is Banvel, but it's also sold as Clarity, if some are you. And, and I should add that I will... Um, I'm going to try to give you a table with all trade names and, and common names just for your own reference because there's a whole list um, of, of many that I can't include in here. And the carbo carboxylic acids, clopyrrolid, triclopyr, which is garlon, and I should just tell you that garlon, uh, triclopyr plus 2,4-D the, the often come together and the, the trade name is crossbow, if some of you are familiar. The, this group of herbicides is much more widely used in non-cropping systems. Natural areas, okay, we talked about that. If you're trying to manage invasive plants, very often broadleaf plants, these are some of the herbicides that are used in these areas. So much more agronomic type herbicides, landscape, much more natural areas. Not that you can't use them in some cropping systems, but they're really aimed at, okay? 
So foliar apply. So I don't want anybody to come to me and tell me that 2,4-D, you're going to see damage in the old leaves first, uh, that it's a contact type herbicide. No, it's moved. And it does have some activity. Some of you are going to say this, although I say foliar applied, 2,4-D does have a bit of activity also in soil. Okay? But generally speaking, these are foliar applied. They're most effective when applied to the, to the leaves. That's why Chemlon guys come and they're spraying. What are they spraying? They're spraying MCP, a combination of 2,4-D, MCPA, probably dicamba. You can put these three because they're, as you noticed in labs, some of these, although they have the same general mode of action, some are better on one or two key species. And if that's the, the species you're trying to control in your, in your lawn, for example, then this is something you might want to use. For example, in lawns, creeping charlie or grand ivy is a real problem. 2,4-D doesn't do a really good job on it. Okay? It twists it a little bit, but it doesn't. But I think you know, what I've seen is that if you put in some MCPA, it just gives it that extra punch to knock off the ground ivy. Okay? But now you're getting really specific. I wouldn't be asking you these type of specific questions, but I just want to give you a general feel that although these are grouped together, they do, you know, we saw Banvel had a, you know, dicamba. Did you remember the effect on, on uh, uh, velvet leaf? How it cupped and curled and twisted much more than 2,4-D. Okay? So as you work in this area, and let's say you would be a chemical rep or you're just familiar with a crop consultant and you use these products, you would be familiar with this over time. The goal, you know, this is an introductory class. You can't be experts in this, but just recognize that these are the big categories. If ever you'd be doing this 24 hours a day or you, this is your career, you would be able to rattle these off, okay? Again, for exam purposes or lab purposes, I would not ask you to draw these or pick them out and tell me what they are, but I just want to give you a sense of what these products, this is that benzene ring, okay? Dicamba, I didn't get 2,4-D in there, okay? But 2,4-D would be two... The sec this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, six carbon double bonded benzene ring, okay, organic compounds, okay, not organic cropping systems, these are organic compounds, okay, and they have various, okay, reaction groups, but this gives you a sense of what these compounds look like, okay, beyond the scope of this course to kind of get into the organic chemistry part and what's the reactive groups, but this is, this, these are the growth regulators as we call them. Again, this is a key herbicide if you're working in, um, in blueberries, for example. Exazinone or Valpar is, is probably one of the most commonly used ones. I keep repeating because I, I did my on, on summer working up in New Brunswick, just across from, you know, in Canada, across from Maine, blueberry country. And that's what they were using, okay, at the time. It's, it's actually in there. So, oxen type or growth regulators, okay, some generalities, okay. Again, this information is there. I just want to kind of reinforce some of the earliest herbicides including the earliest, 2,4-D. Approximate time 2,4-D was, came out. When was that? Approximately. Mid-40s, early to mid-40s. Okay? 2,4-D. Absorbed through foliage and translocated in the symplast. Very, very important. That's how you have to kind of think about it. Soil activity is highly variable. It could be zero for some in this group to they can last in soil very long. Example. One herbicide that's in this group, how many of you have heard of picloram or tordon? Tordon lasts in soil. You know, it's one that you have to be really careful about in this group, okay? And so where is it used mostly? Industrial areas, power line areas, where you don't care if it didn't, actually you're looking for long residual activity, but not in a cropping system or in somebody's lawn or, you know, okay? So just giving you some general, general points here about these products. Used in many grass cropping systems, okay? Remember, what these herbicides do is they're selective for broadleaf weeds. They control plantain, dandelions, okay, uh, the sorrels, all the broadleaf in your turf. And then if you've got corn or wheat, okay? So very specific to broadleaf weeds. It's great products. You can imagine. I mean, selectivity is something else with some of these products, Okay? A major problem with this group, you have to be really careful. Banvel's in there, okay, is that they, there's, there can be off-target injury. This group is really prone to drift. If the temperature is too high, you can get Banvel flying off from your corn over to your beans and knocking off your beans. In bad, remember, this is for broadleaf control. They tend to have fairly flat dose response, okay? 
They don't, you know, a low dose can, can cause some injury, even to your crop. You have to be careful. Okay, the safety margin is a little too close sometimes for, for comfort. Effective group, okay, and even, you know, and you have to watch it, even though, you know, you, you can go below the recommended rates, it can still cause injury if the conditions are such. So be careful with this group, read the labels. I'm not gonna ask you, give me the label, you know, for each of the products, but be aware if you're using Dicamba, Banvel, or you're using uh, 2,4-D, MCPA, read carefully as to when not to spray. What temperatures, humidity, because you could run into lots of problems. Even if you're doing recommended rates, do not spray over 90 degrees if it's a 90 degree Fahrenheit or the plants are stressed. You will injure your crop, okay? Just, you've, you all know this, I just wanna make sure you, you get this, okay? What do these products do? They act at the same site as natural oxins. Indole acidic acid, that's what IAA stands for, okay? But they're even more active, much more active than your natural auxins. That's why they cause the plants. Because natural auxins are not going to, you know, have the plant. The plant's not going to die from choking and, and, and uncontrollably reproducing. And the cell division goes haywire, okay? And so what happens? The term we use is epinasty, the twisting and bending and curling of broadleaf weeds when these products are used. That is referred to as epinasty. You get the bending, swelling of stems, deformed roots afterwards, and tish, finally tissue decay. Yes, Bob? Tony, when you say it's acting at the same site as the natural oxygen, so it's happening at the meristem? It's usually at the meristematic levels. We don't know, as you'll see, um, it's the, the exact site of action and mode of action is still speculative with this group. But that's where it's thought. It's basically the, the idea here is that these oxygen mimics outcompete the natural auxins for the binding site, which we think is somewhere in the, obviously in the cell, but probably in the meristematic region, and they are much more reactive, okay? So it's basically you're getting like 10 times the, the amount of natural auxins that you would be getting, okay? And so they're displacing the natural auxins that would have normally just, you know, cell would have reproduced gently, and, you know, nicely, normally. These guys get in there, outcompete the natural auxins, and just the plant starts just dividing uncontrollably. Eventually, it's dividing so fast and there's not enough food to supply it that it suffocates, basically starves and chokes. The piping, the foam gets clogged up with these cells because it'll bend. That's where the bending, you can imagine that bending, how are you going to have a nice foam to transfer? It's like, you know, having a clogged pipe at home. You know, you got a, you know, a, a U-shape and something gets stuck in there, it's going to be tough for you to get open, okay? So, but that's, that's a good point. But this is a group, okay? That's been around, so here's the, the, what we're talking about. Blockage, root inhibition, meristematic tissue, most affected, okay? Symptoms are evident on new growth first, the sinks. Remember source the sinks, okay? Basis of selectivity, why aren't the grasses affected? It's, and I'll talk, we have a lecture on selectivity. But basically, it has to do with differential retention, translocation. There are just differences. The grasses just don't take the product up fast enough. They're just, it's slower, so it's not getting to the site of action where it's going to do the damage, okay? It's not held on, on the plant long enough for whatever reasons, okay? And there is maybe some metabolism involved, maybe some breakdown, detoxification in a sense. We just don't know, okay? And that's why I say mode and sites of action. Keep in mind, these guys have been around for 60 years. Over 60 years, limited resistance development to this group. Okay, you would think after 60 years, these are widely used products. 2,4-D, dicamba, I mean, these are very widely used, okay? If they were anything like some of our newer herbicides, you would think that we should have had resistance. We do have some resistance cases, but nowhere, you know, what we would expect. And I think part of the reason is that we still don't know where these plants are actually killing, specifically what the site of action is. And I, I bet you the plants haven't figured it out either. And so they're trying, you know, and, and so it might be multiple. And that's why I say that a secondary effect is this increase in ribonucleic acid, RNA, and protein, which causes the plant to become meristematic, okay? So how does the plant die? The plant dies by choking, starvation, you know, of nutrients from the roots as the plant is choking, and this overgrowth, explosion in, in growth, and meristematic tissue. Okay, almost like cancer cells, just kind of just going haywire.
What a way to go. And remember, low amounts of 2,4-D are actually used in titular culture. You often see this in nurseries. They'll use it if they're trying to get you know, a particular uh, cultivar or species to grow at low amounts. But the amounts that are put on here are way beyond what, they, what the plant can handle. So are you guys? What OK. You, Sorry. What do you mean when you said on the, on the last slide, they cause it to become marismatic? You mean like it's going to cause axillary buds to start growing? Yeah. It was meristematic tissue is just, it's just, you know, very quick cell division. It would be like the root hairs, the, you know, the, the growing tips. And if you look at the, you know, very actively growing parts of the plant and also the parts of the plant that require a lot of energy. It's like a, you know, a young child. I mean, you just got to feed it because it's, you know, one day they're here, they're, they're, that's what happens to these, except that it's on, and the plant can't be fed. And once the, the phloem is blocked, then the plant really starts. It's still dividing. These things are going haywire, but there's no food to supply it. They basically the, the connection. So that's what meristematic tissues. In normal plants, that's usually root, root hairs, you know, growing tips, okay? Uh, that's not to say that you can't, if the top is knocked off, you might get auxiliary buds. No, I just, I didn't know if you meant that it's going to increase the growth at the primary or like at the apical mare's time, it's just going to cause all the actual buds to grow and kind of show. It, it, in some cases it might, but really what they're referring to is the apical. Meristem. That's where it happens. Now, when that's knocked off, then just as a site, so that shuts off, breaks apical dormancy, then you get this proliferation, which, you know, exacerbates the problem. Now you've got all these things growing and there's no food because the foam's blocked. So it's, it's kind of a chain. It's a snowball effect. Once one, you know, thing starts going, the rest go. Okay? So this is, this is an important group. And I just wanted to show you, this is not... Um, Typically, I just wanted to show you this, this condition. One of the things we do at that weeds competition is also talk about um, non-target effects. So this is a 2,4-D and, and what's called a, a, a fused brace root that, that happens when you use 2,4-D or dicamba improperly. This is, you know, these products are registered in corn, but if you're, you're mishandling it, so how does this happen? Uh, and, and typically, so you, as a student, you need to be telling them, hey, you know, this, what happened here? You know, they'll tell you, like 2,4-D was applied or dicamba. Hey, you can use it in corn. What's the problem? How could I get these uh, fused brace roots? You know, you just notice. It's just, and typically then the student has to kind of, you've got to think about, oh, what could have happened? And one of them is that you applied the herbicide late uh, when most of the corn leaves were, were out and you were taking in a lot of product. So, uh, you know, that's, remember I told you, you know, you, if the plant takes... I mean, they're not, you know, they're tolerant. Grasses are tolerant, but you put enough of the product and there's enough foliage to take it in, you could cause injury to the plants. Okay, so any herbicide, too much of it will kill, no selectivity, uh, too little, everything survives. Okay, so misapplication, you know, that whole sprayer calibration issue. You don't want 500 acres or 1,000 acres of corn to look like this. And it can happen. Okay, so... Uh, this is not just, you know, you'd like to see this in, in, in the weeds, of course, but you don't want to see it in your crop, okay? So that's why I put that there, just to kind of remind you that when things aren't applied properly, and this is just this diffused brace roots, and you all know what those brace roots are, right? Like they anchor the, the corn down, okay? So this group, you should be, this is a big group. For those of you in the turf landscape area, this is big. This is big, but also in, in, in agronomic situations. And you know, natural areas management, because this group is, has, is a very effective group. There's no question. Okay? Uh, it's hard to see. I wish it, I wanted to show you something called the rolled or the buggy whip whirl on corn. When you apply this, again, late application, okay, or misapplication, you basically, the corn does not furl properly, and it's, we call that buggy whip. It's kind of, you know, twisted and, and curled, um, and, and I just, I wish this was a little clearer. Maybe I'll, I'll try to show you if we have any examples in lab. But if ever you hear this roll, then, and that basically the, the whorl or the leaves in the corn remain, you know, they don't unfurl properly. I mean, you'll notice. You'll look and you say, what is going on? What happened to my corn? Okay? That's, again, late applications. So read the labels. The only legal entity, right? Not what I say or what's written in the Cornell recommendations or what you find on the web. It's the label from the company. You have no liability issues, okay, if you do not follow recommendations. So it's very, very important to be aware of that, okay? This is referred to as leaf strapping. Now, 
You're going to use two, you won't use, certainly use 2,4-D in soybeans. It's, it's, it's a broadleaf crop. So here you would, it's disaster. It would be like dicamba moving from your corn over to here or banvel. But this is referred to where the leaves basically look like they're all kind of curled on top of each other. We call that leaf strapping. And you have, you'll see it in labs. Some of you already saw it last week. Okay? This is not fun. I have seen fields, you know, four or five hundred acres of, of, you know, not that this product, but basically drift along, not the 500 acres, I mean the farmers, farm, but, but a basically, you know, a 100 foot swath separating one grower from the other. I don't know if it was the same field or not, but we visited and it was just this stuff. That's disaster. I mean, you're sorry being yielded. Depending on how severe it is, you're likely not to recover from this product. So you have to really be careful with this group. Very effective. Oh, the other thing that you get this, and this is a common issue, sprayer tank contamination. Because you know what? You guys are busy. The crop consultants, farmers, the growers are busy. They've got a lot of things going on, especially if you're, you know, you've got dairy on top of that and you do your own spraying and so forth. You're running around. How many times do I go to a field, you know, trying to figure out what the problem is? And I asked the grower, what, you know, what did you spray? Okay. And he's saying, well, you know, look what happened. What did you spray before? Did you clean out your tank? You know, and then, oh, yeah, I think I did. You go back in there, oh, my God. And you see, I've seen Roundup in there. I've seen, you know, Dual. You have to be really clean it out properly. How many of you have run into tank mix or, you know, you know of situation where that's happened? Matt, what was your experience? And you'll, and you'll see the pattern early on. You'll see it early because they basically, right, the piping wasn't cleaned out. You're supposed to kind of let that water go through the whole system, clean it out, okay? And you test it on the side, you make sure, but things get hectic. I, I guarantee you, I know the feeling. Just like we're all going through now, it gets hectic and it's the last, you go, ah, oh, what's the problem? But boy, you can, you can really run into, into issues, okay? Uh, sometimes you'll see 2,4 dB, this is butyrac, okay, on soya bean, you'll see what we call callusing on the stem. You get all this really abnormal growth, okay, if herbicide is applied post-emergent, which it's not supposed to be, okay, at all. It's not even, a butyrac, I believe it's, it might be registered for beans, so I'd have to double check. I know it's for alfalfa, but it might not be for beans. But again, what they're showing you, if you have misapplication or, or, or just, you know, drift, Okay, you will get this kind of, so this is the stem of the beans, the soybeans, this callus growth, almost, again, it's, you know, cell division, think about it, it's just, you know, uncontrollable um, cell division that occurs, okay? Foliar applied, translocated through the, uh, the phloem, generally, you see damage in the younger plants, younger parts of the plant, I should say, okay? Same thing, this group, inhibition of aromatic amino acid synthesis. Do you know what this group is, if I don't show it to you? Roundup. Amino acids. Glyphosate, Roundup, also known as Rodeo. Some of you know about that product. Sulfosate is, is, is also a glyphosate product. Uh, touchdown, for those of you. Non-selective herbicides, okay? Currently, the most widely used herbicide in the United States, pesticide, let alone herbicide, the number one in terms of pounds AI being used, this is it because of Roundup Ready crops, okay? We're talking here, 95% of our soybeans in New York State are Roundup Ready, 40% of our corn, and it's going up each year, Roundup Ready. Alfalfa was out, they did not approve it. Alfalfa was ready to be released. Monsanto had it. Roundup Ready alfalfa. We have Roundup Ready bent grass. Uh, there was Roundup Ready wheat, and then Monsanto got so much flack that they put it on the shelf. And because of concerns with just, you know, use, you know everything having this, this mode of action. Yes, I'm. Are they making Roundup Ready rice? Uh, I, 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 I did. I did, did hear that. Oh, and I should add, uh, from the previous group, if some of you are interested, there is now a, what did they come out with? Dicamba resistant beans or something. Yeah, the, uh, that's just, I mean, they haven't come out with it, but they, 
They found the gene. They were able to, to move a resistance gene, you know, that affects dicamba or banvel that would kill, you know, soybeans. There now you could use, because soy, you know, dicamba banvel would kill your soybeans, okay? But they now are going to be um, working on, on uh, transgenically, and it just was out about five, six months ago in Science or Nature. A group somewhere in the Midwest had uh, spliced the gene for resistance, okay? So that's, that's something to, to keep in mind, okay? What does Roundup do? I mean, if you hear so much about it, most of you may not know what it does. It inhibits a very important enzyme called EPSPS. You know why? That's why people don't just... 5-enolpyruvyl-shikimate-3-phosphate synthase. I mean, you can see why it's just, you know, just EPSPS enzyme. Okay, what is this thing? This enzyme is found in the chloroplast, and it is a major catalyst for a pathway called the shikimic acid pathway, which does what? What does this pathway do? It produces or synthesizes, allows the synthesis of three essential aromatic amino acids, which are phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan. What's aromatic? Ring structure. Okay, I keep repeating it. Just those, you should be kind of, oh, said it about 10 times now. You must mean something. Something's on, okay? You're catching on. It's going to be in December, but you'll have caught on what I'm, I'm getting at, okay? So that's really what's happening. And these are, now, this enzyme is not found in animals. It is only found in plants. And this might explain why, in general, glyphosate is regarded as a relatively safe product, okay? from a health perspective. Although, as I mentioned, there have been reports, recent reports coming out of the Scandinavia, particularly Sweden, making some links, although it's not a direct link and it's going to take more studies, with prolonged use of glyphosate and brain cancers. I'll leave it to you. It's not to say it does or it doesn't. I, I think at this stage, the jury's still out. But the fact that it's you know, found only in plants certainly is something that's a little more reassuring than a product that attacks the, uh, you know, some insecticides that attack the central nervous system of an insect, um, which are, you know, mammal, which would be really scary, okay? But nonetheless, just be aware and keep, keep your eyes out and stay tuned to the literature news about what, if, if anything comes of that. At this stage, I would not be alarmed. I would just keep that in mind, say, okay, there is, but in general, it's considered a fairly safe product, and that's why it's so widely used, effective and safe. Okay? And as I mentioned, okay, what actually kills the plant, we're not 100% sure yet. You'll see some, you know, there's still a bit of controversy. Is it the fact that these three amino acids are not produced because the pathway is blocked by glyphosate and then the plant basically doesn't have these amino acids, i.e. cannot produce proteins? Okay? Or is it because once you stop the, the flow Okay, the whole process, the, the pathway, um, you accumulate toxic intermediates that are normally would have been broken down if the enzyme was working, but now that you've blocked the enzyme, these things accumulate, and the, the ones that they're looking at are shikimate and shikimate 3-phosphate, and I'll show you a pathway just to show you. Okay, so that's where the jury's out. Is the, are these, although, as I mentioned, one way they got around to kind of test that is they supplied, okay, these three amino acids to the plants, and the plants still died, which kind of indicates that maybe it is the buildup of toxic intermediates that are not being broken down. Basically, the pipeline is, is clogged, and so now you've got a backlog of these guys, and these guys, when they accumulate, they start causing problems. The plant can't just put them in vacuoles, and there's too much of it, okay? So, here's some general characteristic of this group, which glyphosate, first detectable symptom is growth inhibition, followed by a slight chlorosis. So you all know if you've used Roundup, you're not going to see the plant dead in, you know, in a day or two or three or four or five. You start seeing a yellowing at the, the, the growing tips, and it's going to take a couple of weeks before the plant is what you would consider gone. That's, remember, this is where Monsanto, I was saying, spiked part of the glyphosate with a little bit of, you know, of paraquat or at least of a contact type herbicide just to give the growers a feel that, hey, this plant is dead, or at least it's not going anywhere because it's still green. But it's by all means it is non-competitive. Its growth has stopped. So if anybody tells you the plants are still green, you can pretty well be assured that the plant is not going to go anywhere. Yes, Annie? Does that reduce the efficacy of the 
uh, it's, it doesn't happen too fast, so that there is still some transport. That's why I was saying, I mean, the plant happens is so, so if the idea is you're adding a bit, let's say a little bit of, of paraquat, um, what you have to be is the amounts that they use are, are relatively slight. That if, if, if it's killed, it's going to be a, you know, a little patch. Uh, and so, yes, there's going to be, the efficacy might drop off, but they've, they've worked that out. Okay, but you're right. I mean, to, to, you didn't want to, you wouldn't want to have that anyway. But again, symptoms are slow, especially under cool conditions. Okay, approximately 10 days after application, chlorosis, remember turning yellow, and then necrosis, the plant dies. But it's, I've seen two weeks, two and a half weeks sometimes. Slow action, again, is an advantage. Okay, so that the herbicide accumulates in the growing points where it's going to do its damage. Okay, that's where you want it. Do you guys know how, how did we get herbicide resistant? How do they actually make the Roundup Ready beans and corn? What happened? Who's taken the GMO debate course yet? They took the gene out of a bacteria in the soil and replaced it. So there's a plant on with the gene from the bacteria. Right, and what is it about the bacteria? How come it's not getting killed? It's less sensitive to glyphosate. So what they did is there's a naturally occurring soil bacterium. This was found by accident. Okay? They took this gene. It had the same gene. Okay? Um, and they found this gene. Uh, and it was relatively less sensitive to glyphosate. Okay? That's why you have to be careful. I, I want to say that these crops are not you know, Roundup ready or Roundup resistant. They're not resistant. They're Roundup tolerant. Tolerant, because if you increase, you spike it too high, the, this thing is going to be, glyphosate is going to attach to it, and, you know, at high enough quantities, and will cause damage to the corn or to the beans. But generally speaking, the, the amounts that we're using and the recommendation rates this is a fairly insensitive gene coming from these bacteria that's inserted into the genome of the plants. And Cornell was one of the first places where they did that up at Geneva with the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the, the shotgun approach? Gene gun. The shotgun, yeah, right. Don't want to do it with the shotgun. Uh, but they've, you know, much, you know, and, and the folks actually second and third floor here, plant breeding folks, they're like some of the world-renowned folks. Okay? Yes, Joe. No, I mean, I, I mean, in fact, we have growers in the Midwest that are going two, three times if they missed a window or the plants were, you know, they just didn't, and we're starting to get some tolerant weeds, in fact, some resistant weeds. What, what I'm saying is that it's usually that one-time dose. If it's too high, it would get this. But if you do two sprayings or three, you need to go at three. I mean, it's a you know, waste of money, energy, and stuff, but that generally wouldn't kill the plant. But it might be a little, you know, dicey, but certainly a couple of times I've, we've seen it here. Most often in our soybeans here, one time is enough. You time it right, you don't need it. And you can see why the growers have adopted this. This is the fastest adoption of any technology ever in, you know, in ag. I mean, within a period of 10 years, you've gone from, you know, 0%, you know, adoption rate for Roundup Ready beans to 90, 95%. I mean, that is unheard of. And you know that most growers, I keep telling you this, are generally a fairly conservative bunch. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's risky what they're doing. They have to take chances every year. Some of you are obviously from farm and know that. You never know if you're going to have a crop or not or what's going to happen. Uh, so when they adopt something, they've given it some thought and they make sure that this is effective. So it speaks highly of, of, of you know, these products. Unfortunately, my concern is that, that you know, relying on the same mode of action or mechanism of action is going to cause disaster because we are getting weeds that have become adapted just because we, of overuse of glyphosate. Okay? So, just keep that in mind. The insensitivity of this gene is what's really allowing these, these, these crops to be sprayed and not be killed. Okay? Is it sufficient to rotate between glyphosate and glyphosate? Yeah. It's, that, there are two different modes of action. Uh, glyphosate will be uh, weed resistance code number 9, and I believe glyphosate might be 11. It, again, you don't have to know that, but just there are definitely different modes of action. That's right. The one concern... 
and I don't know if this was raised in the IPM class or not, that it has happened, is when you have growers, busy as they are, going from one Roundup Ready, you know, kind of crop, one transgenic to the other. We had a grower that went from Liberty, you know, was using Roundup Ready and then went to Liberty Link, glyphosate, mixed up the seeds, put it out, sprayed Liberty glyphosate on Roundup Ready, okay, a Roundup Ready crop, killed, disaster. Got, they got mixed up, the seed got mixed up in the bin, and, and how many of you have come across that? That is not a good situation. Uh, but to answer your question, yes. And th that proves that, yeah, you could do that. that. That would be a good strategy. In fact, that's why. And who's, remind me again, who was putting out Liberty? I know it used to be at Venice at the time. I was trying to think Liberty Link. Is it BASF now that's taking it over? I was trying to think who, who's, I'll check one of the big manufacturers. And part of it was to compete against Monsanto. That's, you know. In a perennial, in a perennial system, will, will uh, any of these chemicals that drip into the soil, will they be taken up by the root system? In this group? Yeah. In, in uh, none of these, none of these are taken up. Now glyphosate is basically uh, broken down microbially and in some cases adsorbed to the soil, but it is not taken up at the plants. There's no up uptake. This is not 2,4-D or atrazine. So strictly, this, this is clearly strictly foliar applied. Uh, just to show you, this is, again, not expected to know this, but I wanted to show you the, uh, the glyphosate form here. Okay, is this, this component, this is the, the structure, the general stru structure, N-phosphonomethylglycine. And this is the touchdown, the sulfosate, which is the, the cationic, uh, cationic component of it. There's two, two branches of it that, that, are, that are being, and this is, this is the product touchdown. This is the product roundup or glyphosate. Remember now that glyphosate has is, is gone generic. Monsanto's lost its, its, its control, its patent over it. So now you've got a lot of other companies mixing these, you know, glyphomats and, you know, Syngenta's in there and Dow AgroSciences. So... Just like a genetic drug now, it's open to the market. So you're going to see more of that, which is scary in a sense, because now we're going to have even more of the, the same mode of action. Okay? I think generally it does. Generally, because that's what they're going to, they're going to target that. Um, hey, does, for those of you who are, you know, get round up, what's the technology fee now? For, does anybody know? Or because it, usually you just buy it, but there's a technology fee that you need to that's included in the price when you buy, say, a Roundup Ready or Liberty Link or Imi, Imi Corn, Imazethapir. I it used to be. I'm not sure what the amount is, but uh, just recognize that's in there. But yeah, that's much cheaper. Competition usually is good. Yeah, that's why it's scary to see, you know, two, three banks left and, you know, five major, you know, herbicide companies or pesticide companies because that, that's a problem. Just want to show you, this is the... the uh, the actual uh, pathway that's affected, you don't have to know the details, but um, what I want to show you is this. You've got this phospholinopyruvate, PEP, okay, as, as the, the precursor. And then you, it goes through here. You've got shikimate. This is a whole series of steps, okay. And these are the products that we think are accumulating and are actually resulting in death, the death of the plants because basically the glyphosate binds to this EPSP, synthase, that's the enzyme that's being blocked. So think about glyphosate, you know, here's the enzyme and glyphosate locks right in there. So what happens is, of course, now, uh, you know, this shikimate 3-phosphate, okay, with the, in, in the presence of this enzyme and phospholinopyrrhate will lead to these other intermediates, which eventually lead to these three aromatic essential amino acids, okay, that are the building blocks of proteins, membranes, and so forth, and enzymes. So tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And again, they're, they're uh, aromatic because of the six carbon benzene rings in them. So, I mean, if this thing is blocked, you can imagine what's going to happen. First of all, the plant's going to, these are not going to be the end product. The float, the, the chain is being stopped, okay? And it's, this is, these guys are backing up. This stuff is still coming in, and it's, you know, it's just backing up. I mean, over, sooner you're going to get an overflow, and basically these become, that's the thought, that these, are likely to become uh, toxic to the plants. And that's what eventually kills the plant. Okay? So, and that's what they're talking about here. The glyphosate blocks the activity of this enzyme, resulting in a reduction of biosynthesis of these amino acids. What they don't say here, though, is that 
you know, recent information and recent data also shows that, that the accumulation of toxic intermediates that are not broken down can also be ca the cause of death. Okay? And again, I wouldn't ask you to kind of go through this, but just kind of keep, keep that in mind, okay? Um, I'm just showing this in corn. Oh, no, this is not. This is chromosome. Not, look at the bottom picture. That's what I wanted you to do. Amino acid, this is glyphosate. If this is non-Roundup ready corn, okay, you'll get bleached white appearance. You'll see, notice the growth, okay, at the apical meristem, okay, the world patches of green. Where are you going to get this? If it's not Roundup ready corn, you certainly shouldn't be spraying Roundup. It can happen if you're going to get drift. And you have to be careful. You get drift, okay. Uh, and, and, of course, it depends on drift. So you don't want, and I've seen it, stuff drifting. They, very often growers are going to be spraying Roundup where? Next, next fields, they rotate beans. They've got soybeans. They're spraying. You get drift, and you look at the corn, and the corn is non-Roundup ready in some cases. Okay? There's still only about 40% of our, of our corn here is Roundup ready. Good percentage of it is, is BT corn, but not Roundup ready. Okay? So, um, and let me finish off with this last group, since this is, this is another important group. Again, what's happening here is these are foliar applied herbicides. They move in the symplasm. They're phloem transported, okay? And you see damage usually in the young shoots first. Remember that first category? These are all examples, okay? Think about that. Look at the group. This is a big group. This is called the ALS inhibitors. Acetolactate synthase is an important enzyme right here in the chloroplasts, okay, which prevents the, pr the production of essential amino acids. Those three essential amino acids are only produced by plants, and we, have, we need those. Leucine, isoleucine is definitely, I'm trying to remember the third one, but you look at some of the products. All, a lot of these products that end in uron, halosulfuron, permit, in corn, very big, excellent control of yellow nutsedge, okay? Uh, Chlorosulfuron, prim beacon, imazethapir, pursuit, really good, broadleaf grass control, okay? But also one of the most recent groups, some of the first uh, herbicides in this group came out in the early to mid-80s. Within three years of use, we started getting resistance development. So this and the ACCase inhibitors, those that cause the the grasses to become all mushy are the two groups, and I'll show you in the lecture on resistance, you know, the exponential increase in resistance cases with these herbicides. Great. They're so specific that the plants have basically adapted. Initial symptoms include succession of growth, shoot merry stems. You get this purple, purple look. Remember I told you, and I'll show you a picture in, in case, and a bottle brush appearance of roots. If you pull out some of these roots, and sometimes when you see permit being used, I've seen it. Basically, the secondary roots are stunted and short, and it looks like it's a, it's a bottle brush. You know, just like almost like a, you know, a comb or something, or a brush. And that gives you an indication. That's a good, you know, um, characteristic for the uh, ALS inhibitors, okay? Slow development. This is not a group that you want to, you're going to see fast action, even slower in some cases than Roundup, okay? It takes two or three or more weeks to actually see the plants dead. And so that's sometimes a concern for growers because they want to see the thing dead. Although, as I mentioned, cessation of growth happens relatively quickly. The plant's taking up some nutrients, but no, it's not competitive for all practical purposes. Okay? Just showing you some of the structures. Again, if you're familiar with metzulfura and imazepir, imazethapir, so these are two different herbicides. Flumetulam, broad, broad strike. Okay? Just giving you a feel. This is what they inhibit. Okay? These are the three essential amino acids that all of us have to have if we're going to be lasting long on the planet. And you're getting it from vegetation generally unless you're taking vitamins or supplements. Leucine, valine, isoleucine. What is the general, how would you categorize those amino acids in terms of their structure? What's the term we use for this kind of structure? Starts with an A. Aliphatic. It's the opposite of aromatic. So if I ask you to compare and contrast aliphatic uh, branched amino acids versus aromatic, see, there's no six carbon benzene double bond ring here. Okay? Just structurally there. Okay? But these are essential. And what this ALS inhibitor, and I should and note 
I think I, I didn't include it here, but I just want you to note that you might hear of this herbicide referred to as, I think we've got another name for it also. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know on what page it is, but right under, under the uh, glyphosate figure on my, it's, just note there's a, also a synonym of this um, enzyme called acetohydroxyacidic synthase, okay? A-H-A-S. Just make a note somewhere. To go back, when you're reading it, it'll, it'll be in the notes, but it's not in here. And I just want this here has a synonym, okay? And it has to do with what precursor it uses to break down. But what we're saying is if this is broken down, these two parts are broken down, you're not going to get the production of these amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, okay? So that's what these herbicides are doing, okay, and why they're effective. But if a plant can overcome this one, you know, mode of action, it's in free. There is just showing you amino acid, okay? This is amino acid synthesis. Uh, this should be, in this case, I, I'm, I'm referring to uh, ALS inhibitors. I wanted to show you the pink... This, you see this with a mesathapir, okay? Uh, when it's really high temperatures and you have to be really careful. Some of these products you can use in soybeans. That's what that is. But if you apply it here, we're, we're looking at crop damage. How can this happen? Is if you apply this post-emergence on days that are, you know, it's very warm and humid or misapplication, okay? And there's, we also get, get stunting and growth, chlorosis. We'll see this in, in the greenhouse uh, today, Okay? I'll leave it at that. We're going to get to the bleachers next time. So please, this is an important section for both your prelim.